Uh, thank you all for coming on the last day of the conference in the afternoon. Appreciate it. Um, my name is Dr. Jonathan Cachet. And my background is in neuroscience. I have a PhD in neuroscience. So what to talk about today is about resource efficiency, which we're defining as the most uh, efficient use of water, electricity, nutrients, medium, everything that is an input to your cultivation operation and using that as the most cost effective way. Operational resiliency defines your operation's ability to sustain or adapt to changes within the marketplace. For example, the dropping wholesale cost or value of cannabis. Uh, and the $500 pound is there to mention that, you know, prices are coming down. Can you hit that uh, cost of goods sold? Do you need to get much lower than that? So I appreciate everybody coming. I'll scoot through some of these slides and do a Q&A afterwards. Cannabis has a dirty secret. Lighting, fan, climate control. There's nothing economical about growing cannabis indoors. Growing pot takes electricity, a lot of it. They're using high pressure sodium lights. It's a major electrical fire hazard. They absorb a lot of energy and create a lot of heat. The carbon emissions from growing enough weed to fill a joint is like driving 25 miles. A massive carbon footprint. The cannabis industry could change energy demands. The high cost of production drives the wholesale price up. On a commercial scale like we're doing here. One percent. One percent of all electricity use in the United States. Went to pot cultivation. The state has spent some three billion dollars buying power. We've got to get to work solving all the problems. Is the grid ready? Global warming is a major threat. Scientists are sounding an alarm about climate change. If anybody still wants to dispute the science around climate change. This is an existential threat. We must begin to count the many hidden costs of what we are doing. Fight the power! So just put that in perspective, you know, the, the climate change is occurring, carbon footprint of the cannabis industry, as we've already seen, is bucking clean energy goals. And so Sun Grown Zero is an option to choose uh, to reduce that carbon footprint. And we'll show you how we do that in this presentation. A bit about who we are. So John Pericone is the CEO of Sun Grown Zero. He has 15 years of cultivation experience out in Humboldt, and he was involved in lead construction before that. Uh, I already mentioned a little bit about myself. Uh, you know, I handle the technical aspects and the design of facilities, and Sam Os Osborne uh, handles our sales and our sales process. We also have an advisory board mem uh, members made up of, uh, you know, sort of a, experts in their own field. Brian Saff, for example, handles operational efficiencies. He handles the design and production line of all of our, all of our facilities uh, while, I, while I model the light space. So this is essentially what we're talking about here, the grower's dilemma. Um, you know, ever since uh, dispensaries sort of got their uh, rain year, they were able to force the cost down here in California because they were the only legal outlet. Uh, then we moved on to getting lawyers involved. Testing now is coming on for line, branding, compliance, taxes. So the cost of compliance is very closely approaching the wholesale value of cannabis. And if you're looking to have an operation three or four years into the future, thinking about resource efficiency and reducing those production costs is really the best way to ensure your survival when that happens. So Sun Grown Zero is a hybrid light cultivation facility. It's designed for operational efficiencies and precise and very environmental control. What we're able to do with that facility is reduce your costs, your costs of goods sold, improve the quality of your product and the flower coming out of the space, the value add of being able to advertise your products as sustainable or eco-friendly and put that out as a uh, you know, key part of your brand. And then like I mentioned as well, beat business resiliency. So your ability to adapt to changes in the economic market around you. Uh, and there's also a brand new element to this, regulatory compliance. And so I think you guys might have all seen the news out of Massachusetts, but they're now limiting grows, cannabis grows, to 36 watts per square foot. Uh, that immediately wipes out HPS, uh, and it had, takes a really good and really efficient LED design to maintain under that. What I'm going to show you guys is that the Sun Grown Zero uh, system can achieve far below those 36 uh, watts per square foot. This is, these are all um, you know, headlines, some of them not too far ago, not too far off. 
uh, all relating to the energy uh, uh, regulations out of Massachusetts. So as the video showed you guys, how are we achieving all of these things within one system? We're harnessing the power of the sun. The sun is the best light spectrum, so it has the most intensity. Best of all, it's free. So we use the solar tube technologies to do that, and I include this, this slide here just to give you guys some, something that was an early indication to us that plants respond well to the light coming out of the solar tubes. Uh, as you can see, she had this uh, plant in her kitchen window for 10 years, and then with about 18 months, it crawled up the ceiling and over to the light that was coming out of the solar tube, and she actually expressed that she had to continually cut it out of there. It kept on going towards that light. So the solar tube systems uh, are made of a patented uh, internal lining that's called Spectrolite Infinity. What it does is it allows us to send down 99.7% 90, of the light spectrum and over a run of 20 feet, 94.7. So this is unmatched within the, the field of tubular daylights. Uh, no other tubular daylighting company has the Spectrolite Infinity and they're typically made of this enhanced silver, aluminum, or iodized aluminum. And so you can see how quickly over the span of 20 feet that the light intensity throughout those tubes degrades. Uh, so for a quick overview of the technology within, these, within the solar tubes and how they work, I'm going to uh, switch it over and let solar tube explain it. One of the reasons we developed the Sky Vault series was we had a lot of requests to daylight very large spaces where we can get upwards of 30, 40, 50, 60 foot or more so that you can really bring daylight where you need it, when you need it, regardless of climate, regardless of geographic location, and regardless of the space type that you have. One of the unique things about the Sky Vault series is that it's configurable. We have a core unit that you can use to bring in daylight. We have an amplifier that you can use to drive daylight down to the task level rather than spreading it high up directly below the diffuser. And we have a collector that will allow you to maximize low angle daylight, but actually filters out the harmful infrared energy that would bring heat into the space. The thermal insulation panel is a dual pane thermal barrier inside the daylighting system. It maximizes daylight throughput while minimizing undesirable temperature changes. And the daylight dimmer allows the occupant complete control of the amount of daylight coming through the system. You may have the exact same building in, let's say, Phoenix, Arizona, where you may just use the core unit. Now, that same building in Portland, Maine, you would probably want to add the collector to really maximize the capture of low angle sunlight. Larger traditional daylighting systems, like traditional skylights, you don't really get the same kind of daylighting early in the day, late in the day, and during the winter, a lot of times you really don't get any benefit from the daylight. Uh, so you basically have to leave your electric lights on. In fact, most buildings that you go into that have traditional skylights, you'll see that the electric lights are on anyways. They're not really achieving the energy savings that they could. For a traditional skylight, you may require three to 5% of the roof area penetrated to daylight the space. With the Sky Vault series, you'd probably only require one and a half, at most 2% of the roof aperture penetrated to daylight the same space airports, convention centers, manufacturing facilities, airplane hangars, very large big box retail spaces. There's really nothing else like it on the market. So we're gonna focus on reducing costs. How do we do that? Again, we're using the sun. Uh, what you can see here is 150 square, uh, square foot of cultivation space. It's actually 74 if you're just talking about the canopy area. But that entire room right now has no artificial lights on and it's operating at 40 watts per, or 40 watts. That's it. I mean, that's less than a light bulb at that point. So in considering the Massachusetts regulations, the HPS is somewhere between 65 and 70 watts a square foot. That's just considering the lights alone. LEDs can achieve 20 to 40, so we're within the range of that 36. Uh, if you look at the average of our uh, total watt usage, at 40 watts for less than one gram per square foot. When we were harvesting and growing up in Sonoma County, averaging all the flowering time together, we had an average daily watt use of 710. So it's about five to six watts per square foot. So far below the 36, per, uh, 36 watt per square foot uh, limit. Um, as many of you probably already know, the cost of cannabis cultivation indoors, more than 50% goes into the lighting and the climate control. Um, that 
reflects itself in the power use energy graphs of an of a HID. So what you'll see here is that when the lights come on, we have a strip plateau, they're just on and they're steady at that state for the, 12, the entire 12 hour period. We're averaging almost 700 kilowatts per day in a 10,000 square foot facility in just the lights. If you were to switch over to LED, that kilowatt load is still a plateau, but it's lower than what the HPS lights are. So we're, we're getting closer to more operational efficiency. The way that the sun-grown indoor system is able to be the most effective is that we only need to use the sunlight, or we only need to use the artificial light when we don't have enough sunlight. And you can see this characteristic peak here that goes down and then back up. So what that represents in the morning as the light levels are just increasing, the, the solar light levels, we use our LEDs, we keep our plants where we need to be. Once we get to about 11 and 10 or 11 noon, uh, we're able to shut those LEDs completely off and they only respond if there's cloud cover or some other obstruction that's blocking the amount of light coming through. So this characteristic peak, all the, all the surface area here, the, the area of this space in here represents savings. Um, here's some actual energy use graphs from our site in Sonoma. You can see the characteristic of these peaks in the, in the beginning, flood leveling off during the day and then peaking coming up. This red line just represents the load that you would have if you had four double-ended HPSs in that same space. It's about what, how you would end up doing it. So we're definitely under that load. Uh, and by the way, this is the entire 100 square foot that we're growing, 150 square feet. This is not just the lights or the LEDs, it's the entire thing. You can see sort of the characteristic up and downs that happen with the HVAC as well. So, oh yeah, this was on a, a typical summer day. So this was a bright sunny day, uh, ready to go. Our next one, is on a, par a typical cloudy day up in Sonoma. And so you can see that our, our valley here, the characters in the middle, did not, you know, we don't really see that as much. You can see the increased use of the LEDs here along with the HVAC, uh, but we're still under that 4.4 kilowatt load of an HPS system. Um, and then this is a partly cloudy day, so you can see that we went over here, we extended this a little bit longer till noon, and then we brought it back up towards the end of the day. Here is uh, an example of uh, a flowering period within the sun-grown zero space. And this is the average daily power consumption for the entire month of August. So this is looking at every single day in August and then averaging that time of per, on a per hour basis. And what you can see again is that peak and then the valley here and a peak up again. So we're saving all of this electricity that we don't necessarily need. Um, if you guys have been out to the trailer and we talked to you about uh, maintaining the environment, because they bring in full spectrum sunlight without the heat, like, like what an HPS load would do, we're not involved in a constant struggle with the environment. So we're not continually trying to bring down the temps while the humidity raises, now we're bringing down the humidity, now the temps are going up. We don't have to have that battle. And so you're able to reduce your HVAC system load and it's able to use it much less. Um, it's worth mentioning here too in California, especially uh, that with an indoor space like that, you have much better ability to capture and reuse your water. So when we were growing, there was 36 plants in that room, 82% uh, of the water used was actually reclaimed. So that's through our dehumidifiers, that's through rain catchment. Um, in, in California, that's a, a very important point. And in fact, when we were up in Sonoma, you know, they were more, they were more enthusiastic and happy about our system because of the water saving ability and the reuse of that water than they were necessarily about the electricity. So if we're looking at just the operational costs, this is just the light electricity. Uh, you can see here that an HPS over the course of the year, we're about 700,000. This is a 10,000 square foot facility. LEDs can drop that, so there's still a significant savings there. Here in the greenhouse as well, for just the operating of the lights, and then you can see down here, Sun Grown Zero for the annual uh, cost of your lights, the artificial lights. So what we're doing on that operating cost is dropping about 30 to 40 square feet, or dollars per square foot in your operational costs. If you compare that to the HPS down in the Sun Grown Indoor, that's about $650,000 a year. And because of that savings, and because of the ability for that to happen year over year, the ROI in a system like the Sun Grown Zero system is about 2.1 to 2.6 years. It's, it's very quickly recouped. Um, there are other ways to, th to think about the electricity and the ener energy efficient rebates. I wanted to do a mention here for the Resource Innovation Institute and the Cannabis Power Score tool. Uh, you can check that out at resourceinnovation.org. What they're trying to do is collect uh, operational details in terms of the energy use, in terms of your type of grow, the HVAC that you're using, your yields, your, and your uh, production rates. 
um, to include them in, a, in the power score tool so everyone is able to sort of gauge their operational efficiency against that of other growers who are similar. So if you grow indoor in uh, Oregon or you grow a greenhouse in Oregon and you want to pair that to a greenhouse in Michigan, the Cannabis Power School will help you assess how efficient your operation currently is compared to other people in your location and using the same cultivation type. Um, I also want to mention too, the cost of the Sun Grown Indoor System is eligible to be reduced by utility companies. And so we've spoken with PG&E, you know, um, tons of utility companies all over the country. We work with Bob Gunn over at Synergy, who's created this nice map to show where are their energy efficient rebates already being granted for cannabis cultivation operations. And he's had a success of about $3.8 million in uh, incremental cost grants to growers just from switching to the HPS bulbs over to LED. You can see that Nevada, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, those have all been successes. In California, it's sort of in discussion. We've talked to people, we need to see that through. But I want to say to you guys that the cost, the increased cost of the Sun Grown Indoor System can be reduced and mitigated with energy efficient rebates to bring that cost to the same as an HPS light or HPS grow, a high intensity grow. So that's, that's reducing costs. You can reduce your operational costs, you can reduce your upfront costs by switching to an energy efficient process. How do we improve product quality? Well, I wanted to talk about two things here. The, the subjective versus objective quality measures, right? Everybody grows the best, everybody knows the grower that grows the best. We're in California, everybody in California grows the best. Subjective quality. Objective quality is reflected in the analytical profile. So your concentration of cannabinoids and terpenes. You know, what does your, your stand, uh, strain or grow's analytical profile look like? Then there's quality control. And so this relates to your ability to successfully grow a harvest without molds, without pesticides, without bugs. Anything that would fail you at an analytical test is, is, is you know, a lack of good quality control measures in your process. Um, and the Sun Grown Indoor System helps with that quality control by reducing the failure rates, and we'll get in there. So how do we go about improving product quality? And what I'm speaking about is the objective product quality, that analytical profile. Um, as you can see here, these are all sort of uh, factors that affect the cannabis grow. Of course, intensity is most directly related to yield. We have spectral quality, most tightly related to the plant structure and the photomorphogenesis, the taste, the smell. And then, of course, the photo period. So to get it to induce flowering, we reduce that photo period to 12-12. Um, so what we're sort of focusing in right here is the spectral quality. How, how rich is the, the light spectrum that you're giving to the plants? So we have this handheld device out in the, the trailer right now. This is a spectral radiogram. You can, this is the light that's coming through the solar tube system. So you can see, this is what we need for PAR. We're focusing on the blues and we're focusing on the reds. There's a little bit of a dip here. This is typically where humans see with their eyes. Plants sort of see light differently. So you can see that we're bringing in that blue and we're bringing in that red with less of a focus on the yellow. Uh, when you switch over to an HPS, you know there's different bulbs you can get now that improve the blues, improve the reds, but HPS by and far is mostly putting out in the yellow spectrum. And for anybody that's been in an HPS grow, this is pretty evident with how yellow it is. Uh, in our system too, we included heliospectra LEDs, the ability to turn up the reds and the far reds on demand and modify that spectrum after they already have a base of the natural sunlight, so a very full spectrum base of natural sunlight. We were then able to increase the reds uh, if we wanted to induce flowering or help them with the flowering development, or we could push the blues up more if we want more elongation and stretching in the veg uh, cycle. So increase sort of the ability of the plant to do what it needs to do and then drive that in a certain way with the LEDs. Okay, so we got another video here. This is to demonstrate what the light looks, looks like as it's moving through the space. So you're gonna see a time lapse here and there are no artificial lights on in this room at the time. So this is all light coming through the solar tubes. What you'll notice here is that there's a hotter spot that sort of dances uh, across the top of the space. That's a result of the sun moving through the sky during the day. And we really think that there's a lot of benefit to the plants in not getting large spikes, like only getting you know, the large spikes of intensity in par sort of momentarily and then it comes back and washes to them rather than you know, just a sort of artificial grow, you know, grow, grow, grow with the HPSs that we, that we see. 
So these PAR levels are dynamic. What we measure and shoot for is 300 to 600 PAR in the ambient space. You know, the sunlight fills up the space in a bigger and a different way than just a sort of a 2D plane of an artificial light. So ambient PAR levels around 300 to 600 that, you know, surrounding in the whole space. But then as that hotspot moves around, we're measuring between 900 and 1300 PAR in that brighter spot. So when we have enough PAR and light in the space, we're turning off our LEDs completely. So we've done several harvests and several iterations of this. The first sort of step was, do the plants even respond to this light? You can see in that time lapse, they do very well. Now it is, can we re reach commercial production rates in terms of our harvest and our yield? So 28 grams per square foot represents a pound in a 16 square foot area, so a pound per tray or a pound per light. Uh, and then we've had it up as high as 36 grams per square foot within our recent build. So we're comfortable in pushing forward to say that you can achieve commercial production levels at a far reduced cost. And for those, you know, HPS growers, I know that you might, you know, you are achieving a little bit higher. We'll, we'll yield that and say, fine, you can grow a little bit, you know, you can 40 to 50 to 60 grams per square foot, but we can, you're not doing it at a reduced cost. So you're sacrificing your electrical bill, you're sacrificing your bottom line and producing that extra. And we will get there, certainly. All right, so now I'm gonna pull up a graph that, that speaks to the quality control a little bit. So this is a, an example of operating costs. So it includes our light electrical costs, it includes HVAC and climate control, it includes maintenance, uh, so bulb replacements, uh, HVAC filters, stuff like that, crop loss cost, cost, costs. So you can see that we're about 1.8 million on a 10,000 square foot uh, facility using the HPS and HID. The bulb replacement happens regularly. You know, We're looking at $100,000 or plus a year in bulb replacements. And what I've recently begun to understand is that with the bulb replacements on the HPS, as they are used and degrade, the spectral quality or spectral output of those HPS bulbs changes. So people, you know, at this point will now change that every harvest, you know, every six months. Uh, with LED, we're down lower. Really, I want to highlight and, and tell you about this greenhouse. So the greenhouse, the, what, the reason why this is up so high is because of crop loss. And so we're seeing now in the United States sort of a 35% test failure rate. Up in Canada, they've been doing greenhouses a little bit longer, a 55% test failure rate. And really that's the result of trying to balance the climate inside with the changes in outdoor ambient temperature. And so, you know, desert hot springs are somewhere where it's 50 during the night and then 120 during the day. That's really difficult to bear, you know, without insulation on your greenhouse to, to keep your internal environment steady. So the, the risk of molds and mildews and other factors that are gonna uh, affect, like fail your crop basically because of the analytical tests and analytical test requirements in the states and then in Canada. Canada is even higher in terms of the pesticides and parts per billion so that's, that's where we're getting these numbers. So greenhouse ends up being a more expensive uh, annual uh, type of grow because of that potential crop loss and the, and the failure. Sun grown indoor, again, down here. We don't have to replace bulbs. We don't have to worry about the out changes in outdoor ambient temperature. We're growing in a fully insulated indoor environment. Uh, so it's, it's worth consideration. Now the objective quality here. Uh, this is an example of tests that were done by SC Labs. Uh, what we were really interested in was, does the same exact strain, so the same exact cuttings, one grown full sun outdoor in Sonoma County, one grown in our sun grown indoor room, are we getting the benefits of the outdoor grow? And so I don't know if you guys know this, and I, I, I learned it you know, a few years ago, but it was surprising to me. Uh, on average, outdoor grows of the same strain will produce a higher cannabinoid content, a more diverse cannabinoid content, and the same thing's true for the terpenes. So if we're bringing the sun indoors, our question was, do we get those same benefits? And you can see that we have similar levels of all of these uh, terpenes, slightly higher terpenes in terms of percentage, it could be within the margin of error. But what we're trying to show is at least the diversity that was gained by having the full sun spectrum outdoors is also gained by having the full sun spectrum indoors. All right, so we did operational, we did reduce costs, we did, uh, improve quality, now we're talking about differentiating your brand and sustainability. Uh, the consumers coming up, it's several studies to show that they will travel further, they will pay more for a sustainable product. And this is, the younger they get, the more that they feel and, and are driven this way. So being able to differentiate your brand, and especially in California where it's so far advanced and even getting on the product shelves is going to need essentially a, a differentiated product. 
It's a zero, it's a sustainability. Uh, so today's breakfast practice is standard tomorrow. You can see, you know, Dr. Bronner there, is a, uh, that, that company is a, a staunch uh, supporter of sustainability in, in the global environment. I think another way to think about it is Amazon just bought Whole Foods. So they understand that people are going into that sustainability, eco-friendly direction. And so there is certainly no harm done to your brand by making it sustainable. In fact, I would argue that it's probably the best thing that you can do at this point in terms of getting your product off the shelves. And we've seen that the heat is on. So this is, again, this is about the reduction of costs and the wholesale uh, value. Um, whether or not it hits $500 a pound yet, um, it's going to at some point. This commodification of a crop, as more production happens and demand and supply change, being able to get your cost per pound sub $100, including labor, is a huge, huge factor that you need to consider if you want to operate several years into the future. We reduce costs by utilizing the free natural sunlight. We improve quality by having that full spectrum, that composition of light, and then having controllable LEDs. You have a sustainable brand, you're resource efficient, and your production processes are tuned into operating as most efficiently as you can. And that business resiliency you know, three to four years, you don't have to shut down the doors or remodel everything, switch to LED, or then consider going to, to a greenhouse. Really, if you haven't set up a cultivation operation at this point, it's almost negligent not to go in a hybrid lighting situation. That, that would be a greenhouse or the Sun Grown Zero offering. So Sun Grown Zero as a company, we have two main sort of service lines. We have installation clients. So these are, you know, growers that contact us that want to reduce their carbon footprint or want to reduce their electrical load. And so we custom design spaces specifically for their facility. Uh, we're also looking for flagship partners. So to help us finish the raise to get a larger 10,000 square foot facility up and running down in Desert Hot Springs in, in the investment front. The uh, design and engineering process goes through these steps. So essentially the first thing we'll do is qualify the location. And so if you're calling me from Arizona, Southern Arizona, you have a 22,000 square foot canopy, I'll ask you how big your individual rooms are. Um, really anywhere in the Southwest is a, a sure bet. It's definitely going to, to support your, your grow in the way that we're talking about. Uh, when you move over to like Canada or Maine uh, in Ohio where I, where I currently live, it brings that savings down to about 40 to 50%, but we, all, we address all of those in the qualification process. Then a level two, so this is beyond just me sort of looking at the annual days of sunlight and the amount of tubes that we would wanna put in that space, but actually to start looking at historical weather data within the location of your site. So the way that we make those 3D projections of PAR is we have 15 years of historical weather data, including solar irradiance, and we can get an average over time what the solar output in your specific location on a specific day at a specific time. And so we do that in the level one and the level two feasibility analyses. And this is intended to move very sort of in parallel with your construction process. And so we're talking to the engineers, we're talking to the growers, we're talking to the, the business managers, the financial managers. We help uh, procure and then install by using local solar tube distributors who have years and years of experience installing these things in any different building type. And then ongoing sort of uh, continuous optimization and support we have our own operation that we can then do you know, different things with the light recipes and different spectrums and get, you know, see where we can push strains in different ways. If we wanna uh, increase the amount of THCB in a strain, what light spectral composition can we use to do that? And then we continually sort of push those back out to our install partners to make sure that they have the latest optimizations in reducing costs, but also the most recent optimizations in growing a high quality product. So here's more examples of custom facility designs here. You can see the solar tubes up here, up top, and then the uh, color heat map bars represent PAR. I don't remember the exact scale on this one in terms of the, the legend for the uh, blue versus red, uh, but it gives us an idea of how uh, that looks. So up here you can see that we have six by six solar tubes, over here four by four, and down here five by five. So we look at all of these different configurations to figure out what is the most optimal amount of tubes that we could put in your space, given your roof and given cost considerations, and how can we balance that with our, with our output for your specific location. This is a, a shipping container example that we worked on in San Diego, but this illustrates how we can look at it at different times. So 10 a.m., the sun's coming up, you see it sort of bounces this way out of the tubes. 1 p.m., the sky's, uh, sun's high in the sky, so we get these uh, increased intensities. 
and then at 4 p.m. the sun's sort of beginning to move out of the, you know, into the horizon and it reduces. So we do these for every single uh, install potential client um, modify and build specifically for your facility. What's your floor plan? What's your rooms look like? All right, how can we integrate? Uh, this is what uh, the renderings of the flagship look like. Uh, you can see veg over here and different flowering or uh, our flowering rooms over here. We have a process where we move the uh, plants through these rooms. And so every time we're pulling out two trays of harvested, you know, finished flower, we're pushing in two trays of veg, you know, veg or clones ready to go in the veg space. What this does when you have an operational process like this is reduce your labor costs. So rather than have huge spikes in labor at every harvest, because you're harvesting 2,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet, you can reduce that sort of you know, temporary work that you need every two months, have the same employees that are always working here that are in, in, you know, value the project and are excited to be about part of your team uh, and have steady, consistent output in a situation like this. Uh, so we got a video to show on the uh, flagship. <laughs> So the value of being resource efficient, gaining operational, increase, or operational resiliency, you increase your efficiencies, you're going to reduce your costs. That increases your prof profit margin. High quality harvest consistently year round. So being able to capture that sunlight in an insulated indoor environment and control the temperature against the fights of the ambient temperature year round, no matter where we are, less failure rates. You can improve the company image, you can increase brand loyalty, you can increase brand differentiation by adopting sustainable uh, uh, cultivation practices. Risk mitigation and save labor costs, as I mentioned there recently. It's, it's you know, having grown and, and been around many growers, you know, it's constant firefight in terms of balancing that climate. You can be proactive about those problems rather than reactive. And one of the nice things about having a grow room intelligence system, I'm sure many of the exhibitors will tell you this on the floor, you can identify mechanical failures before they happen. And that's happened to us twice now to where there's a huge you know, spike or unusual outlier spike within an energy use profile. And we went in the room and said fan two. You know, fan two is where that spike's coming from. The fan looked fine to us, but it was, it was all gunked up. It was about to fail. So we were able to do that, proactively replace that fan rather than reactively, oh no, fan's out, gotta go to the store. You know, plants are now getting hot. Uh, you can also avoid the cleanup and remediation costs in terms of the uh, output of what is around your uh, facility. Uh, so I hope that I've uh, given you a good overview. It's a talk I've given a few times, uh, if anyone's seen it. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I have a few back pocket slides if we get into it. Uh, but I appreciate everyone being here. It's a great attendance for a you know, Wednesday afternoon, so thank you.